Hello everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Itai Shakuri. I'm director of open source at Aqua Security. I'm also a Cloud Native ambassador and your host for today's show. So this is Cloud Native Live. Every Wednesday, we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things and break things, and they will answer your questions. This week, we have uh, Chris Tompkins from Tegera with us to talk about how to leverage eBPF with OpenShift uh, with Project Calico. He will introduce himself and the uh, technology in a second. Uh, before that, just a quick reminder uh, uh, that this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, just be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. So, uh, Chris, how would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, well, the first thing, I'm just really happy to hear you say that I'll break things because that covers me if I break things now, so great. Um, so <laughs> my name is Chris Tompkins. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera, uh, Tigera um, who uh, develop um, Project Calico as part of the Project Calico community. Uh, I worked as a network engineer for many, many years and gradually tr got drawn towards uh, automation, large scale automation technologies. Um, and uh, when we started to do Kubernetes, I was uh, deploying Calico and I really liked the product and believed in it. So so I, I joined the team as a developer, a developer advocate. Cool. Um, so yeah, do tell us about Project Calico, I think for start. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great place to start. So um, Calico is uh, an open source uh, networking solution uh, for networking and network security for uh, containers, virtual machines, and native host-based workloads. So uh, the idea is it provides a consistent experience um, and set of capabilities uh, for all of those kinds of workloads uh, in public cloud or on-prem. Um, from a from a you know a tiny cluster all the way up to a multi thousand node cluster, um, and we can support environments like um, Kubernetes, OpenShift, uh, Mirantis, Kubernetes Engine, and 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 so on. And the idea is to prevent uh, prevent present the same um, the same experience to uh, to uh, developers and um, and engineers. Um, we offer. Uh, a standard, you know, best practice security model and and a high performance uh, data plane, uh, set of data planes actually, and uh, incredible scalability and um, and it's a real world production hardened um, uh, product um, and open source uh, setup that is you know is heavily deployed already. Yeah, it's it's good that you mentioned that it's also oh, <clears throat> sorry open source, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there is an enterprise product, but everything we do, everything we do today will be in the open source product, and um, the enterprise product adds on some features uh, around observability. Uh, well, lots of features, but primarily around observability. All right, that's cool. Uh, so uh, the topic of today's show uh, involved eBPF and uh, OpenShift and Calico. Uh, do you want to uh, set up the the context for this? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, I guess if you if you think of it as um, Calico uh, allows you to implement your network policy and your networking across those environments that we discussed, and it uses it uses some technology in the data plane uh, of the nodes to actually do that work. Now, um, I did a separate talk which I could talk for half an hour, but I won't about um, the you know, control plane and data plane model for, for networking and so on. But just suffice to say that the, the data plane is how we implement um, the actual uh, networking policy uh, that, that enables the networking to happen. Now, um, Calico actually offers a choice of data planes. Uh, the chat window has just disappeared on my browser, but I, hopefully it will come back. Um, so yeah, Calico offers a choice of data planes. And the idea behind that is that um, different people have different use cases and expectations for uh, the data plane of their, uh, of their network environment. So uh, in order to achieve high performance, um, you want to have 
the minimal uh, data plane amount of data plane code that allows you to implement the feature set that you actually need. So uh, our, our main uh, original data plane was implemented mainly with IP tables, um, which is great. It's still in production for many users and the performance is good. Um, it's rock solid and, and battle hardened. Um, but we wanted to offer another data plane, which has some advantages over that. And uh, so as well as the, the standard uh, Linux IP tables data plane and the Windows IP, uh, the Windows uh, data plane that we offer, we have this third data plane, which is the Linux eBPF data plane, which is what we'll, what we'll be focusing on today. And then just to say as well, there is actually a fourth data plane in tech preview, which is uh, uh, VPP vector packet processing data plane, but uh, it's in tech preview. It's really interesting. Um, I encourage people to look at it, but we won't talk about that anymore today. Mm. Yeah, so, so, oh, yeah, you go ahead. No, no, I just uh, wanted to comment. Certainly, eBPF is a really exciting uh, technology, I think, and very, uh, I'm happy that uh, we get a chance to talk about it today because it's very relevant specifically now, I feel, and uh, see a lot of movement around it in the industry, mm -hmm. especially from the networking perspective, of course. So, uh, yeah, just a yeah. Little... yeah, so shall we drill a little bit into in, into what it what it's all about? Sorry, I... I, I shall, shall we go a little bit into what the eBPF is all about? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So, so yeah, as you said, as you said, it's, it's, you know, it's a really interesting area. Um, and what eBPF basically is, is uh, in the, the old days, if you wanted to have some code that ran in the kernel of the Linux kernel, um, then you would need to either actually submit code um, into the uh, kernel repos and get it uh, approved. And, and obviously that's, a really long process and a very difficult process for good reason. Um, or the other way you could do that would be to write a, a kernel module. Um, but what eBPF actually is, is a way to run, you can think of it as a, a way to run virtual machines inside the kernel. And those virtual machines are um, extremely high performance. Um, they're heavily secured because they only have access to a, to a very limited number of um, of a kernel functions depending on where they are mounted um, in the kernel. And uh, they, so as well as being high performance and secure, they're small bits of code that live inside the kernel and operate inside the kernel under those restrictions. So in the case of, um, of how Calico uses uh, eBPF, what, what we're essentially uh, doing is replacing the functionality that we previously implemented in IP tables in eBPF inside the kernel um, and and the the actual um, performance increases obviously but there are also some side effects that are later on I, I, um, I don't have many slides but I do have one diagram I'd like to show and when I show that diagram I can explain why uh, why that functionality also improves with um, with the BPF yeah I, w I once heard the um... A description of eBPF that I really liked. I sorry, I don't remember who said it, so I apologize to the person who <laughs> said it to me. But uh, uh, they described it as uh, like JavaScript is to the browser, uh, eBPF to the kernel. Basically, uh, a mechanism, a vehicle for us to extend the kernel and to put our own coder, which uh, otherwise would be very dangerous and difficult. So yeah. Yeah, exactly, and it and it uh, as it, um. You know, I'm I'm actually not a developer in my you know in my first the first part of my job is not a developer, so I have to be careful not to overstep my knowledge. But um, but as well as only being able to make certain function calls and those kind of things, um, eBPF programs are automatically uh, limited to um, uh, execution time and those kind of things. So they can't uh, they can't um, get into tight loops and they can't uh, um, they can't chew up the TPU that kind of thing. So, it, so it's great because there's a lot of protection there to prevent to prevent your program from accidentally misbehaving, um, and yet you get excellent performance. There's also this concept of a BPF map, um, which is basically just a key value store that the BPF programs are able to access, um, which allows them to exchange data between each other to you know to record flows that kind of thing or whatever you might want to do. Now BPF obviously it has a lot a lot of use cases. Um, it, you know, it's commonly used for, for tracing and for, um, you know, TCP dump uses uh, eBPF. Um, but in the case of what 
Calico is using it for, it's using it to implement the network policy in, inside the kernel. All right, sounds good. Um, and uh, just the, the, the final piece there, uh, we talked about Calico, we talked about eBPF, and then uh, we are going to run all of this on top of OpenShift, right? So, so uh, like I'm assuming uh, most of the people know about OpenShift, but just uh, to set uh, set the record straight uh, for Kubernetes users, could you just say a few words about uh, OpenShift? Yeah, sure. And uh, I'll be honest, uh, OpenShift is is the weakest part of my knowledge. You know, it's a it's a big beast. Um, so, uh, but but OpenShift is. Um, the way I like to think of it, like you had a good analogy about eBPF, but the way I like to think of it is that um, a Kubernetes cluster, you can extend it in so many interesting ways with different tools and, you know, for, for observability and for, um, for, for, for storage and for CNI and all these things. And you could spend a lot of time, um, both time and money, uh, trying to figure out what a good Kubernetes deployment model is for you. And I like to think of OpenShift as um, a container application platform based on Kubernetes that takes a good set of um, a good set of uh, additional tools. So as well as being a container orchestrator, um, it uh, it's an enterprise enterprise Kubernetes distribution, and it has a validated set of integrations. Um, it's still Kubernetes, it's still certified Kubernetes, and it's still open source. Um, but it but it allows you to build kind of like a, con a consistent, complete enterprise grade Kubernetes ecosystem, um, and and to the, and then to to run that wherever you choose to run it. Um, you're not limited to running it in one place. The, the demo we do today, the demo I do today, will be uh, will be uh, in AWS, but obviously you can run um, OpenShift in, in any environment. All right. I think that's a very good intro. Uh, so let's get to it. Let's get to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so I think if you, there's a couple of things we can come back to if we end up with spare time, but I think it's a good idea to get uh, to to flip over to uh, just literally the, the the couple of slides I have, and then and then to get to the demo. Um, so yeah, I think you can see my screen. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, so um, this just kind of slide, just kind of this is um, Red Hat's own slide, instantly, um, which I've I've used um, uh, the URL at the bottom there. But but really, this just helps to understand that OpenShift is kind of a big uh, suite of uh, of tools around Kubernetes um, for you know for observability and for um, um, developer services and so on. Uh, but I won't drill into that because. It would be challenging for me to talk about everything on that slide meaningfully, um, but this slide is 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 a really interesting one, and um, this is the one I said that I would briefly mention. Um, uh, I, I said I would briefly mention about uh, where BPF hooked in. So this is the packet flow diagram, and you can see at the bottom of the screen this is this is courtesy of um, Jan Engelhardt, which is it's uh, on Wikipedia. This diagram, if you want to see it yourself. But this is the packet flow through any Linux node. And you can see that the green part there is the layer three network layer. And that's where IP tables and all of those kind of things uh, happen. So you have um, uh, a mangle table, a NAT table, and um, uh, and you can see that the, the, track, the, the packets flow through all of that. And the reason I mention all this is because um, that's also where kube proxy is implemented. Um, so when you run services on uh, on Kubernetes, Kube Proxy uh, implements those services, and it exists in that green uh, that green section. Um, however, uh, down here you can see. Uh, hopefully, it's just about readable. Um, you can see ingress and egress queue disks, and these two points here are where we actually attach our BPF code, um, and that means that the BPF code can entirely sidestep the the main packet flow. Um, so that's why I wanted to highlight this diagram. Um, so as a result of that, um, the advantages of, of actually uh, running eBPF, um, 
Excuse me. Yeah, the advantages of running uh, eBPF in Calico <clears throat> are performance, but there's a secondary, a really interesting uh, secondary benefit, which I'll demonstrate uh, in the demo, which is that uh, is, is source IP preservation. So if we have a look at this diagram, uh, and we'll see this for real at live demo in a moment. Um, but you can see with a traditional Kubernetes cluster with Kubeproxy running, um, you can see that if an external client comes into a, to a service pod, the first thing they do is they hit a service uh, on the Kubernetes node. And then that, that, uh, the Kubeproxy uh, that's, that's serving that service does a destination NAT and a source NAT to replace uh, the source IP with its own IP and the destination IP with the pod IP. And then the traffic gets forwarded onto the service pod and then it comes back. But it's important to note that the traffic, when you're running with Kubeproxy without the eBPF data plane, you can see that the traffic has to go back through the Kubeproxy and therefore it's destination and source natted. And the side effect of that is that the service pod down here never actually sees the source IP of the traffic, uh, the real source IP. It sees the source IP of the load balancer, uh, of, of, excuse me, the Kubeproxy. Um, so one one of the uh, advantages is that once you turn on eBPF, you get a flow that looks like this. So when the external client comes in and they talk to the service, the service is implemented as a BPF program, not in Coop proxy. And that means that the BPF program can forward on the traffic and that the service, the service pod on the destination node sees the real source IP of the external client which maybe might be good if you have a, an auditing use case uh, or if you have um, uh, you need to uh, restrict a particular IP block by region, by, um, by country or something like that. Uh, and then the final, the final step here shown as number five is that if the network allows it, the packet can actually be returned directly um, without going back via the ingress node. So, so those benefits are, um, yeah, you get better performance lower latency and you get um and you get uh source ip preservation um so yeah it's pretty cool cool is that is that thanks to i don't know is it because uh you are uh, um doing the uh network uh routing work at the lower level in the network stack yes All yes right. exactly um uh, the the my colleague Sean Crampton, um, I, I do. I've done some some sessions called Calico Live, um, which is just me and Sean Crampton uh, chatting about uh, informally, uh, similar to what we're doing now. But um, but he's one of the EBPF data plane developers for Calico. Um, so anyone who wants a lot more depth on this, um, if you if you watch those sessions, uh, you know, frankly, he his understanding of the depth is much deeper than mine. But yes, it's that's exactly it. We're implementing it at a lower level, and therefore. Um, by replacing Coop proxy, we can we can introduce other examples. Uh, sorry, other other benefits. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so I think we should go ahead and, and and show it, right? Yeah, of course. Let's do it. Cool. Okay, so uh, so just to explain what I'm going to do, um, I wanted to create a um, I wanted to create a demo that anyone who's watching can actually do this themselves um, afterwards. Um, so, in order to set up OpenShift, we need a um, we need a DNS name, a, a top level DNS name, um, which obviously would cost money. Um, but I was made aware uh, by a colleague of um, of this website, freenom.com. I can't actually recommend it, you know, for, for production. I don't know whether it's, you know, I don't know what their, their production services are like. But if you want a quick uh, domain uh, top level domain name. Um, you can get that here for totally for free. So if I come into into here, um, I've registered this domain, um, registered this memorable memorable domain here. I mean, it's not going to replace Amazon anytime soon, but um, but I have this domain and it's registered for a few months. So the reason I show this is because we need we need a, a top level domain in order to to be able to get OpenShift set up. So the very first step that I did before today because it takes 24 hours to propagate. As you come in here, you grab these, uh, you, you, you need to specify where the domain's uh, DNS should be directed to. Um, so we change it to these custom name servers. So let me show you where I got those from. So 
So I'm using AWS Route 53, um, and I set up a hosted zone. And if we see the code for that, when you set up a hosted zone, you just it's I think it's create hosted zone, and then you specify the the name that you want, which is the same name that we just saw. And uh, Amazon AWS will come back and give you the top level name servers that they want you to use. So all I did was take these four these four names here and put them across into this GUI. Um, so that's step one. Um, Once we've done that, uh, the next thing we need to do is, is actually get the OpenShift installer tool. Um, so I'll come back here. And there are two uh, OpenShift installer tools. Um, so I will actually delete them and re-download them. Uh, no, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do that. Actually, I just realized, yeah, uh, one thing. Hold on one sec. Actually, yeah, good. OK, so yeah, so the first thing to do is, is to download the OpenShift installer tools. And that is just uh, a couple of wget, wget commands here. So uh, you can see it's hitting mirror.openshift.com. And we're getting the stable OpenShift installer for Linux. And then the second one is the OpenShift client. Uh, this won't take long. In the meantime, I'll just remind everyone, if you have questions or comments, just type them in the chat and I'll read them and Chris can answer. Yeah, thanks, Ita. Yeah, OK, cool. So those are done. So we just ex we just um, extract out those two, um, extract out those two uh, tar files. And you can see it just gives us a readme file and a couple of binaries. Um, so I'm going to put our current uh, our current working folder on the path. Um, so we should be able to type OT. Yeah, we can. So I just was testing that my path was working. You can see the OpenShift client is there, so that's fine. So I'm going to switch now. It's a, I, you and I talked about this briefly before we came onto the call. Uh, I'm going to shift to a terminal recording just for a short time, and, and I'll, I'll explain why that is once it's actually playing. Um, so I'm going to use this tool called Ask Inima, which is amazing if you don't use it. Um, oops. I'm going to play, play the recording. Before you play it, if you could just uh, resize yeah. your window so that it doesn't reach all the way down because your name kind of uh, oh hides. right yeah yeah gotcha okay absolutely yeah thanks yeah, i forgot that would happen uh let's move that thank you yeah that's perfect how's that great okay uh yeah so oh for goodness sake, sorry <laughs> i can deal with uh kubernetes clusters but i can't operate my browser and my window let me try again if I go too near to the edge, it tries to maximize. That's great. Yeah. There. How's that? Perfect. Tiny bit off, right? There we go. Cool. OK, good. So um, yeah, so let's start that playing now. And um, this is now the recording. Um, but you can see that it's uh, it's just showing. You can see that this recording was actually done back in June. But this is only the first part. So we will be doing a live, a properly live demo. It's just this first part. And the reason is because. Um, you can see that I'm in the demo. I'm record uh, that I'm downloading those files that we just downloaded. The problem is that the OpenShift install tool actually gives away quite a lot of information that I, I that you that we don't want to be sharing. Um, you'll see in a moment that when I run it, um, it shows all of the DNS names registered to root 53 for the account, the AWS account that you're currently logged into. It also shows um, the secret keys, which again, I don't want to share. So I've actually edited this recording so that this, the keys you see in a minute are, they're not real keys, they're, they're edited. And similarly, the DNS. So here we go. So now we're getting to the point where we're, we're moving on past. So you run this tool, open shift install, create install config. And we're not actually uh, creating a cluster yet. We're creating an install config. Uh, we're creating, you know, the, uh, the, um, declarative um, 
definition of how we want our cluster to look. So we have to specify what public SSH public key we want to use. We have to say where 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 do we want to run it. So we choose an AWS. Um, yeah, you can see it. You can see it was a live demo because I made a mistake. You choose which region do you want to run it in. So I'll choose US West two. And this is the point where, if I hadn't edited this video, it would be listing all the domains here. Um, so that's why I had to edit this. But you can see that we go and we go down the list and we choose the domain that we're interested in, which is the test domain that you saw before. And then we name the cluster. And then we put in the pull secret. Um, now I'm gonna pause there just to show you where that pull secret comes from. So um, so anyone following along, you can you can search for Red Hat OpenShift Developer Sandbox. And if you come here to this website, um, you can see that you get to you can start a trial and you get a free trial, a 30 days trial of uh, as, of an OpenShift developer sandbox. When you sign up for that, um, then you get this dashboard. And in this dashboard, you get your pull secret. And you basically just need to copy this pull secret here, like so, and then paste it in. So someone asked if you could do uh, just uh, recap the last ten commands that you ran. I guess maybe you can do even better and share the the script later on. Yeah, I can. Um... Just I mean, this is an a script that installs OpenShift. Is it uh, doing anything uh, special? No, it's not. Not yet. No, it will do. We we will go into more interesting stuff. But let's. I think it's better. I'd rather recap it here than yeah, than, right. than share the recording, just in case there's anything hiding in that recording in the file that I don't want to share. Yeah, right, right. Sure, um, sure. Uh, but yeah. So so uh, that's fine. So so all all we've done so far really is um, to recap. We we set up a free domain somewhere. We put that into AWS Route fifty three. Then we downloaded um, the two OpenShift. Um, uh, client and OpenShift install packages, which you can Google for those. Uh, we expanded those using tar, and then we ran this. Uh, we then we put we put uh, our current working directory on the path, and at that point, that's when we then we actually run the OpenShift install tool. And this by using OpenShift install create install config, it's going to create a it's going to create a, a, an install config file. Um, and then these are all just this. This is all just an easy wizard. So you can see it's finished. It's created an install config file, and this is uh, the only the only edit we need to make to that file at the moment is this edit that I've made here. So, if anyone's not familiar with sed, what we're actually doing here is we're saying um, the install config was created, and we're saying search for it and re replaced any occurrences of OpenShift SDN with Calico. So we're telling uh, OpenShift that when it builds the cluster, it should build it with Calico networking, not with uh, OpenShift networking. Just to be clear though, uh, this is not going to enable Calico eBPF yet. This is just Calico uh, traditional IP, uh, IP tables data plane. Just wondering why that's not continuing. Did I accidentally press? Yeah. For some reason, that seems to have stalled, um, but that's okay. I can actually, from here, I'll pick it up. So you can see I've, I've pressed Control C. So we're now back to a live, you know, actual live, live demo. Um, so you can see that the next command you use is uh, OpenShift install create manifests. 
and I won't press enter now because it won't work because I did this already this morning because I knew that this would take too long for the live demo. So but what that actually does is it consumes the install config and it spits out the actual manifests which are going to be deployed. Um, so it does that into a folder called cluster. So if we go into this folder called cluster, um, in here, there'll be a lot of manifests. Um, and then there's an extra step which is documented um, on uh, the docs.project calico website, which is actually to download um, some extra uh, project calico manifests and drop them into this folder. Uh, so I'll just do one example, but there are about 30 or so. So you just, um, it's a curl command like this. And we drop, we drop uh, these manifests from projectcalico.org into the manifest folder here. Now, when all of that's done, then you run um, OpenShift install create cluster uh, like so. And then it will take about 40 minutes, which you'd be pleased to hear we're not, we're not going to do that now. But um, but what happens is it will then go and build the cluster. And once you've done that, you will have a, a working Kubernetes cluster, which is what I have now. So you can see that this, this cluster was built this morning um, in preparation for this. So this cluster, if we have a look now, you can see that um, You can see that there's a lot of uh, pods running on this cluster. And you can see that in the namespace Calico system, you can see that we have uh, a Calico node daemon set. So this cluster is now running Calico networking. It's ready to go. But the, but the um, Calico node is still running in IP tables mode, not in EBPF mode at this moment. So I'm conscious of time. Time always runs away, so I need to run on a bit. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate the 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 source IP the lack of source IP preservation. So I have um I have a manifest called Echo Server, and if I show you what's in there. Uh, this manifest deploys, um, makes a deployment called echo server with just one replica answering on port 8080 and it creates a service. Um, and the service is type NLB network load balancer. So this is an AWS load balancer set to NLB. It's important that we use NLB because without NLB, we can't do the source IP preservation. Um, so if I deploy that manifest now, created an echo server and I've created a service. So it's echo server external um, service load balancer and it, as well as having a cluster IP, it has an external IP and it's answering on port 8385 and it's redirecting to that pod. So if I grab that now, this won't work yet. It takes a moment before it's ready. But um, if I try to hit HTTP and then the, the new um, load balancer IP and then port 8385, yeah, it's not working yet. We need to wait a moment. Um, but in a moment, we will see that we're able to hit that, uh, hit that pod. But when we look at the pod's logs, if you re recall back to that diagram that we looked at, you, we won't actually be able to see the real IP of this of, of, of my my public IP essentially. So what actually let's while we're doing that let's have a look. So if we check my public IP now, see that my real public IP is this 31, 31 something address. So let's see if it's ready yet. Not yet. So uh, while this is being created, maybe we can take a few questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so there is a question about um, support in the EBPF data plan for IPv6, if you know. Um, I think it's supported, but I actually, I'm, I don't want to say 100% because I'm, I feel like I might be wrong. Let me see if I can answer that right now, one second. 
Um, no, it doesn't. It's listed as a limitation, actually. So if your users, uh, let me pull that up now. That's I'm glad that I'm glad I checked that and didn't give the wrong information. Um, so if a listener wants to enable the DPPF data plane, you can go to docs.projectcalico.org, and this documentation is really good. You can see that there's some information here about the benefits, and there are some limitations. And one of those limitations is that it does not yet support IPv6. The, the question is actually, like, if you can share or if you know about an ETA for that. Oh, uh, no, I know it's I know it's being considered, but I, I definitely don't know the ETA. But if you yeah. want to join, uh, if the listener wants to join our um, Slack, our Calico users Slack, that's the best place to ask that question. And then I can go away and find out exactly what I'm allowed to say officially and, and I'll deliver the best answer I can. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Uh, another question about uh, <clears throat> the pros and cons of eBPF from yeah. a security perspective. Um, it really makes, I don't think there's a great deal of difference from a security perspective because at the end of the day, the policy is being implemented, the same policy is being implemented regardless which mode you use. Uh, I suppose that you could say that um, the IP tables data plane has been around for longer um, and therefore perhaps you could make a case that it was more secure. However, the, um, the eBPF data plane requ requires a newer kernel and requiring a new newer kernel arguably has security benefits. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's a big, I don't think it's a big consideration actually. Um, I think it, I, I would say they're functionally equivalent, really. That, that's a good point, actually. A question that I also had about uh, what's the requirements for installing the eBPF uh, data plan from a, a kernel or operating system perspective. Yeah, so that's documented. Uh, let me give you the right information. Um, you need a supported Linux distribution, which is either um, uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu 20.04 or newer, or um, 1804 if you have an updated kernel, or uh, Red Hat version 8.2, which has a kernel version of 418 or above, um, or another distribution, which another supported distribution, which has a kernel of 5.3 5, 5 and above. So actually, on that same URL that I just uh, that I just showed you a second ago, um, if you go to if you just search for Project Calico enabling eBPF, you'll find uh, all the information, including the, the prerequisites around the kernel. There's a couple of other prerequisites as well um, around mounting the BPF file system. Uh, so yeah, all, all of that is on there. All right, sounds good. Cool. Um, I think we should push on just in, to make sure I get through this in time, otherwise we may overrun. Um, so you can see that in, in the meantime, the, the echo server is now responding on the port. Um, so if we have a look at the logs, um, There you go. So you can see that we're, we're looking at the logs of the actual echo server pod, and you can see that it didn't see the real public IP of the user. Um, so just keep that in mind because we haven't turned EPPF on yet. So once we have, it should change. Now, the other part I was gonna do at this point was to actually demo the performance, um, but to be honest, we're getting low on time. So I suggest that um, on the Tigera blog, there is a detailed blog post which includes the performance uh, graphs. So I suggest that um, people can go and have a look at that. But just suffice to say that the eBPF data plane performance is significantly better. Um, and if anyone, you know, if anyone wants to test it themselves, they can they can follow along and run uh, run their own tests. Um, so let's actually turn on um, the uh, eBPF data plane now. So uh, the first thing we need to do is to uh, switch the encapsulation for Calico. Um, from IP in IP, which is the default, to VXLAN. Um, so we do that with uh, Calico Cuttle. Uh, what did I miss? Looks like I kind of screwed up that command. One second. I think you're missing a, another. Um... Yeah, did I missing one at the end? Oh, yeah, I'm missing it at the end. Yeah, I see. Well done. Oh, you spotted that quickly. Yeah, there we go. 
you can see that I ran two Calico Cuttle commands here. Uh, there's an IP pool custom resource, and this IPv4, uh, it's called default IPv4 pool. So what we did is we turned off IP and IP encapsulation, and we turned on the XLAN encapsulation. Um, the next thing we need to do is, um, because Calico needs to speak to the Kubernetes API, but the Kubernetes API is actually hosted via Kube proxy. So you can see the problem. If we turn off Kube proxy, how can Calico talk to the API? So we have to do something to help it talk to the API directly. Uh, so what we do is we use this OC command, OC cluster info, and we can see this is where the control plane is actually running. Um, so So I've created a, um, a bit of YAML, a config map um, called Kubernetes Services Endpoint in the Tigera operator namespace. And it has the host name, which should be the same. Yeah, that's the same. And it has the service port. So what we're basically doing is we haven't applied this YAML yet, but let's do that now. And while it's applying, we can talk about what it actually does. Okay, so it's created this Kubernetes services endpoint config map, which has this configuration. And uh, the, um, I'm just gonna put it asleep. If we wait one minute now and let Kubelet detect that new config map, and then we restart the Tigera operator, it will actually tell Calico to talk directly to the API rather than talking to the Kubernetes Kube proxy service. Um, we can see if we have questions uh, while we wait. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read this one. Is preserving source IP just an example of uniform software-defined general purpose networking rules, or is source IP preservation the primary value of Calico? Well, there's two parts to that. Um, the first part is uh, it's not the advantage of Calico. It's specifically of the eBPF data plane. Um, and actually, the way I see it is actually that it's more of a side effect of the benefit of eBPF. I think it, I wasn't in the room when they originally decided to make an eBPF data plane, but I think the primary reason for making an eBPF data plane is the performance advantages. Um, but then uh, I showed that large diagram of the packet flow through a Linux node. And because Kube proxy is implemented in uh, in the layer three uh, green part of the diagram, and um, eBPF, the eBPF hooks are at the start and the end of the flow, in order to implement policy in eBPF, you kind of also have to replace Kube proxy. That's my understanding. And if you're replacing Kube proxy anyway, then you can you can improve it. And I think that was the side effect. But source IP preservation is actually a really nice side effect. Um, it's it's something that is surprising was not there by default. Being able to being able to see the source IP of your of your user, because especially if you consider a compliance type environment, you know, you need to be able to accurately record your logs. So I would say it's it's a benefit rather than the main objective. You have another question before we move on. Uh, just to follow up from the same person, uh, the incumbent or alternative to the eBPF data plan is Calico. In Calico, is based on IP tables. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, if the if the uh, if the viewer has time to watch it, um, I did a talk. There, there was a Kubernetes um, security and Observ observability summit earlier in the year, and I did a short talk. I think it's about twenty minutes about why we offer multiple data planes and what the advantages and, and contrasting those. So rather than talking specifically about eBPF, I said, here are the data planes that we have, here are the advantages of them all. And, and I really believe that that no single data plane is the perfect solution for all users um, because they all have pros and cons. Um, and that includes eBPF. It, it has high performance, but uh, it has, for example, it has the kernel requirement. 
um, which obviously some some environments that's that immediately means it's not possible. Um, so yeah. All right. So now that we've we've waited, um, if we restart the tiger error operator, so we're deleting the pod in the namespace tiger error operator, and it will immediately be recreated. Um, so all we've done there is actually um, told. We've now told the operator that we want Kubernetes, uh, we want Calico to talk directly to the Kubernetes API, not via Kube proxy. Uh, so now that we've done that, we can actually disable Kube proxy. Um, so you can see that. Hmm. Oh yeah, I remember now. So uh, there is. Um, there's an OpenShift operator, and in here, we can tell it that we want to turn off Kube proxy. So right now, if we um, if we have a look, you'll see that there should be five, no six, excuse me, Kube proxies running. And now we just patch, uh, we patch the OpenShift operator to tell it that we want to turn off Kube proxy. And as soon as we do that, we'll see that the they're terminating already. So now we're at the point where we're still not running the eBPF, the, the Calico eBPF data plane yet. We're still running the Calico IP tables data plane, um, but we've turned off uh, we've turned off Kube proxy and we've got the we've got it talking directly to the to the API. So finally, now we can actually turn on uh, eBPF. And we do that, um, again, this is an, an operator command. So we're uh, merging this config and we're saying that we want to turn on uh, BPF, the next data plane BPF. And the cool thing is that enabling eBPF mode shouldn't disrupt any existing connections. So if you have live connections, um, they will continue to use the standard Linux data path until they time out. And when they time out, they'll reestablish using the eBPF data plane, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's prove that we are actually running um, it first of all. So if we look at, uh, we're looking at all the pods in the Calico system namespace, and you can see that um, the nodes are starting to restart. So you can see that one restarted 14 seconds ago, 28 seconds ago. So it takes a moment. There's still one that hasn't restarted, still three that haven't restarted actually. So we just need to, to wait a moment again. I'm tempted to carry on the demo, but I think we have to wait till all six because you know that just by bad luck, you know that the workload we care about will be will be sitting on the wrong node. Um, so let's of course, just, it will. of course, of course it will. <laughs> of course, nothing has exploded on me yet, so I'm still expecting something something to explode soon. Oh, there it goes. We can actually see it terminating. Nice. And it's back, initializing. Cool, okay, so they're all running now. So we're running the BPF data plane. Now, there are, there are lots of different ways that like, we can show that we're running the BPF data plane, but one of the quickest ways to prove that we are is to look at the logs for the Calico node. So if we check, take any of these Calico nodes and we grep, grep their logs for the phrase BPF, uh, we should see, yeah, lots of stuff. It doesn't really matter what we see here, but you can see that, um, yeah, here we are. Resync BPF routes. So you can see that it's doing BPF work. There is more that we can do. If we have time, we might. I might show you a little bit more, but let's first of all check that sort IP preservation again. So if we look at the services again, 
nothing's changed. This is still the same service, still running up time 16 minutes. Now, I'm never sure whether or not I need to recreate the service, so we're going to find out. So if we curl it again, you can see that we've pr we're proving essentially that the eBPF data plane is working and that, remember, the service wouldn't be working without Kube proxy if we weren't using the eBPF data plane. So the fact that I got an, a response from my echo server proves that the eBPF data plane is both enabled and working. Um, so if we look at the logs again now, yeah, there we go. You can see now that we have my public IP. Cool. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um, so, and obviously that means that your, you know, your Apache logs or whatever are going to reflect that, and you can start to do maybe another use case actually might be for um, understanding uh, where your users are coming from, your geo, geo IP maybe as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of use cases for that. Cool. Um, so I think this is good timing actually because. We, because we skipped the performance part, um, we can actually, we can do two things. The first one is for me to show you the performance graphs. Uh, and like I say, um, anyone can read, anyone can test this themselves using the same process. Um, Oh, never mind. I thought I was find the blog post. Um, I'll try to find that in a minute. Um, hmm. I thought I would find it more easily. Okay, never mind. Uh, yeah, if you if you want to send them later, and we can post them in the Slack channel for the show. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's fine. Um, actually, I think I can grab. Let me see if I can grab it right now. Yeah, here we go. Brilliant. Okay, actually, it's fine. I can just show you this one. Um, so this is a uh, a presentation of, on on a similar topic. Um, here we go. So there is this caveat, and this is an important caveat, um, which is that. Um, traffic between two instances, which is a single flow in, in AWS, can only maximum do five gig. Um, and this is nothing to do with Calico. This is an AWS uh, limitation. Uh, this 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 screen grab here is actually from AWS documentation, just to kind of show that this is you know a real thing. Um, so the reason I say that is because we're testing with a single flow. Um, so this is. Um, OpenShift with IP tables, this is the throughput, and you can see that the IP tables is the blue and more is better. So you can see that TCP, it makes very little difference, but if you look at this UDP performance, it's nearly twice as much. Um, yeah. I don't really like spending a long time on graphs anyway, so uh, you know people can come back and validate this themselves. And you can also see that the CPU utilization is lower. So, but I think more interesting than that, let's go back to the CLI stuff because people can look up graphs anytime they like. Uh, so let me show you one more other cool thing that we can we can we can see, uh, and then I think that should leave us with a couple of minutes for any more questions. So one nice trick we can do is um, we know my IP now. So if we create two um, variables. So I created a variable called eBPF interesting IP, and it's my IP, my public IP. And the other one is uh, the interesting port, the port number we care about. Um, we can run this for loop. And what this is actually going to do, this looks pretty funky when you first look at it, but it's not too complicated. So just to break it down. It's 5.55 PM. Uh, my Google Home talking there, sorry. Um, you can see what this is actually doing is it's listing all the pods. Um, it's grabbing the Calico nodes. And there's one Calico node per Kubernetes node. Then it's grabbing the names of those nodes. Then it's going to iterate over those. 
it's going to print out the name of the Calico node, and then it's going to kubectl exec. So it's going to exec onto the Calico node, and it's going to dump the BPF connection track table. And then it's going to grab my IP and my port uh, and the port we care about. So this, what this should do, is there we go. It will show us the flow through the cluster. Now it's probably timed out. The, the flow that we did a moment ago is probably timed out already, so that's fine. So we're expecting it to come back with nothing. That's okay. Okay, so you can see at the moment, there's no record of my flow. But if I run that curl again, and then run the command again, we should hopefully see. Hmm, that's weird. What did I do wrong? I do wrong. Can't save you this time. <laughs> no, 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 I can see that. Um, that's weird. I've used that command plenty of times. It can't be timing, it doesn't time out that quickly. So even though it, you know, I, I ran this and then a few seconds later I ran it. Um, Okay, well, I guess this is this was to be honest, this was just an add-on thing anyway. Yeah. I was just going to show you, you can see the flow, but uh, you what you what what we should have seen there is is the flow coming in on the ingress node, and then reaching the workload, um, and we can actually see that that it's not natted through the flow. I don't know why that isn't working, um, but I don't have time to troubleshoot it now. Yeah, um, do you have any? We're almost up on, on time already. Do you do you want? Are there any more questions? Yeah. So. Viewers, please uh, ask any questions if you have any. Um, and while you're thinking about uh, your questions, uh, maybe Chris, I can ask you about where can people go next if they want to ask more questions, find out more about what we've learned today. Yeah, yeah, great. So, um, so the best place to go is um, doc well in terms of documentation the best place to go is to go to docs.projectcalico.org which is is that one i showed here um and you can see that on here there's quite a lot of high quality uh, resources and if you go to um if you search here for ebpf you'll find that there's um quite a lot of information about what ebpf is and and actually you know quite a lot of detail about uh, how it's working and also there are deployment guides for all of not just openshift but for deploying uh, ebpf on clusters on other platforms as well so that's great in terms of documentation um you mentioned the, the, the you mentioned you have a slack uh, so maybe yeah can... exactly that's what i was going to say next uh, another great place to come is to the calico users slack um which i think if you go to is it tiger oh, no Project Calico. There's a Project Calico community page, and uh, is it that one? Oh, that's taking me back to the same place. Yeah, uh, if you search for Calico user Slack, you will find. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Um, so it's this uh, tigera.io Project Calico community, and you'll find that um, there's quite a lot of information here about how you can get involved. Um, there are these uh, certifications, which are free, which are brilliant. Uh, the, these are for the open source product, community meetings, and um, you can visit, uh, you can find our Calico users Slack here as well. Um, I'm on there all the time, and there are people on there as well, um, Sean and other people who, you know, who are deeply, deeply uh, knowledgeable on, on our eBPF data plane. So any question you have, we, we should be able to answer. Wonderful. 
Um, all right, so I think we're out of time and we don't have any further questions. Perfect. So, um, yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, some, so, uh, one of our uh, viewers said this was uh, thought-provoking, I can agree. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, so thank you for that and thank you for all of our uh, viewers. Um, just I a reminder. Say, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should say thank you to you, though. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, with pleasure. And uh, yeah, see you, uh, everyone, next Wednesday, every Wednesday on Cloud Native Live. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye.